what comes to your mind when you hear Cuba like on the news in conversation stuff like that? Negative, positive, what? Negative. Why? Cigars. It's like a place that you don't want to go to travel to. Not a resolved issue, but a non-issue right, like, right yeah. now that our country's not even focusing on it. Fidel Castro. We don't like him. Why? Because he's a dictator. He's probably cruel. People there aren't happy or see better opportunities elsewhere. I don't really think about things that I don't know a lot about. I feel like I need to educate myself first before I decide how I feel. They're communist and that's pretty much all I know about Cuba, basically. I'm thinking about Fidel Castro. What about Fidel Castro? He's been in power for a long time. I know, I passed it on a cruise to Jamaica. And we pointed at it, but couldn't get too close. So. Okay. Ours, we don't have no freedom in Cuba. Cuba is a very uh, revolutionary country, to my knowledge. I think communism is a good thing. 97% of the population can read. Medical school is free. By like everything we got, they probably don't have. It's the only place that's safe for the black man. One of my veterans, Sister Asada Shakur, who's on exile, is in Cuba right now. I think they need to lift all the embargoes, and just open it up. It's about time. It's been going on for too long. Che Guevara was the one that was pro uh, people living and appreciating the, the beauty of uh, Cuba. The greatest resource to any nation is its people. It's the people that make. 125th Street flourish. If you want to read further, you can you can read this paper here. The final call. It speaks about Cuba, the Good Samaritan. When I think of Cuba, I think of a place that kicked out imperialists and made a country for the people, by the people. Even though it's not perfect, that country embodies what all nations should be trying to strive for: some type of equality you know, um, education, um, medical coverage, you know, equality in housing, and so on and so forth. And of course, I think of Fidel Castro, and Che Guevara, and all of the other great men and women that contributed to that struggle. <laughs> Graduate students at Yale came together as a black resistance reading group and struggled to create the ultimate field trip. They ventured to black Cuba in search of their revolutionary selves. This documentary is a mixtape of a community's historical memory. The traveler's intimate recollections. It's very amusing being here on this spot. And the salvage footage they filmed from their journey from the Ivy League to a rebel state. We are the narrators of this film. What does it mean to you to be a black student at Yale University? Um, I find that question very difficult to answer. Are you mad? I mean, you know, what I'm you very, yeah, I'm, I'm very angry. I'm very angry and lonely. I did feel like an outcast at Yale. On the one hand, I have the community of color that I was raised in, which is very working class. As I would walk around campus, I never at all identified as being part of Yale, even though I was in Yale's power and, and privilege. I had a certain anxiety, I guess I would say, you know, being a person of color too, being black and all mixed race and, and going to Yale and also the class issues of uh, not having been trained in um, elitist kind of Ivy institutions. Uh, I found Yale to be a place uh, that was really exciting intellectually. 
but I felt sometimes that it, the institution is not for me as a person of color, as a person from a middle class background, single parent background. I mean, it's a it's a place that is for the production of the elite, is for the 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 future CEO. in that in that vein so um, in some senses I've, I've felt alienated at times from the institution Yale University was founded in 1701. However, the first African American wasn't admitted until 1850. African Americans weren't admitted in groups until the 1960s. In spite of this long history of racial exclusion, Yale is consistently ranked as one of the top three universities in the nation, along with two of the other wealthiest schools in the country, Harvard and Princeton. A lot of the people of color were coming from middle class households where they may have been like third or fourth generation college students. And even for the people that were first generation college students, there's really this idea of like economics as being the purpose of an education. I have an entire family or community to support when I get out of here. I grew up in just sort of, I don't know, maybe 10 block radius that included um, my school, my church, um, my family. My mom and my godmother worked very hard paying next month's tuition bill. And I just sort of constantly feel that disconnect here. I was one of two or three black grad students in residence in the history department. I uh, was at a reception towards the end of the year and I looked around the room and I looked at the portraits on the walls and I thought, I've got to get out of here. And it was just sort of this, and I still don't have the words for it, but at that moment it was so oppressive, the extent that there was nobody here or there then for me to talk to. And it wasn't that there wasn't anybody black for me to talk to. It wasn't, there was nobody there who was interested in what I was doing. It's difficult to know, I think, in this day and age, how to be political. You feel like you're, on the one hand, um, you know, in solidarity with movements of resistance, but on the other hand, so clearly in a position that makes you at least tangentially complicit in a lot of stuff that's going on yeah. in the world. Where are you staying? Um, I'm staying because, you know, it's almost, I feel a need, <laughs> you know, to stay here and get that degree because I think that's very important. Um, I'm also staying here, you know, because I like school. I like my work. There's some people who would say that, um, that Yale simply doesn't prepare you uh, to cope with black reality. Um, and? And that you are actually becoming not educated, but miseducated or whitewashed. I think that's, as I see that as rhetoric almost, you know, that 
you can educate yourself on campus without without going to class. I mean, you can hook up tutorials to do what you want to do. I mean, people here are not feeding you stuff. They're not feeding you knowledge. I think that's a general misconception that people hold to, you know. You do what you want to do. place affords you that freedom. My experience at Yale has been that if I hadn't been in the African American Studies Department, perhaps I would have felt like an outcast. But I didn't, because um, the department very much became a home. African American Studies is also known as Black Studies, Africana Studies, and African Diaspora Studies. It's an academic discipline that focuses on the history, culture, and politics of communities of African descent. Beginning with the Third World Strike at San Francisco State College in 1968, coalitions of students, teachers, and community members demanded the hiring of African-American professors and classes that reflected the experiences of people of color. The education that Third World people need is one that sees the dignity and the worth and the pride of the people from which they come, enable us to in turn go back to our communities, increase and develop the level of consciousness of our people and why they live in poverty and why uh, uh, racism is continuing uh, the mainstay of uh, keeping third world people poor. Now, African American studies, no matter what it's called or where it's taught, is politically informed at its roots. As far as a research driven, quote, traditional liberal arts kind of program, that's what Yale has in African American studies. That trajectory is very different from, say, those programs that were started with students with shotguns in their hands, literally armed struggle. They have a legacy of a different kind of practice of African American studies. Now, which is better? This is up to you to decide. I got to a point where I felt like I couldn't spend the rest of my life as an activist because it's it's just really grueling, emotionally, physically. I was working as an activist with this organization called Pastors for Peace. Its motto is a people's foreign policy. We would organize humanitarian aid caravans to Chiapas and Nicaragua and El Salvador and Cuba. And I loved that work, but I wanted to make a contribution in some other way. My interest in sort of protest politics um, and the interest that I shared with other graduate students led me to found this Black Resistance Reading Group. It's a way to get us motivated to sort of exploring works that were about anti-colonialism or um, anti-racist politics. I think this was an opportunity for us, you know, for people who are like-minded to exercise some agency over mm -hmm. our education, you know. We had a diversity of people and classes and colors and politics within our group. But at the same time, I felt like we were all, in some kind of odd way, feeling alienated for similar reasons. In black communities around the world, reading groups have continued the knowledge-sharing tradition that began with slavery. Revolutionary Africans would meet secretly to learn each other's languages, teach each other to read, and develop resistance strategies. It can be sort of formal, like the legendary Dark Tower of Harlem, hosted by hair care heiress Alelia Walker. Reading groups can also be grassroots, like the Black Panther Party's political education classes. When we look at struggle, is yeah, that uh, this depends on the educational thing, you did. You know what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism, like you got in uh, uh, Africa 9, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they're nowhere. You dig what I'm saying? 
the reading group initially started off fairly diffuse. Uh, there wasn't a particular theme beyond resistance and, and, and that we wanted it to be a global, that we weren't just talking about the United States, that we're talking about the diaspora. A diaspora is a community of people who remain connected, although they have been dispersed from their homeland due to forces outside of their control. The African diaspora names a worldwide community of millions who claim African heritage and deal with the everyday reality of anti-black racism. I got interested in diasporic issues when I went to Oxford. Fox fees! Fox fees! Education should be free! And met a lot of black people from around the world, Caribbean and West Africa, most uh, predominantly. And um, I realized that African-American issues weren't the only game in town, basically. It was through our discussions that I really began thinking about Cuba again. It's like, you know, Cuba is a revolutionary country and um, it's a socialist country and it's a black country. The rest of us had probably more latent interest and less experience with Cuba, but, but, but were intrigued by it. I think one of my earliest uh, recollections of Cuba was reading the speeches of, some of the speeches of Malcolm X, I think by any means necessary. In one of those collections, there's uh, talk about Castro's visit to Harlem, 1960. Remember that in those days when I came here first, uh, those were the days of the Cold War. The revolution was practically a newborn. That was in the year 1960. Injustice was obvious, discrimination was obvious to me. I knew that here I would have the heart of the neighbors of uh, Harlem. We have shed our blood. We have shed our blood to fight against colonialism and to defend the independence. Yes, let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. My early understandings of communism growing up in the 1980s when the Cold War and kind of anti-communism was so pervasive in popular culture. You tell your guys in Miami, your friend, it'd be a pleasure. I kill a communist for fun. And understanding communism as being something evil. You don't stop this fight, no matter what. that into reading about the relationship between Malcolm and Castro and also Patrice Lumumba, all that kind of wrapped up together, starting to offer kind of an alternative to these other understandings of what communism might be about or what a socialist society might be about. Socialism is an alternative to capitalism and aims to develop relatively equal power relations in a society. Communism is a form of socialism. It simply endorses the public collective ownership of things like factories, technologies, and natural resources. also part of our struggle to see that the amenities of life in the 20th century reach our people. You know, Mr. President, that we're very, very far from achieving the goal of raising those standards of living for which, without which the struggle for independence is not enough. Our friend Angela. profound honor.
honor for a communist than to be considered a part of an educational system which puts knowledge, science, and reason at the service of humanity's material and spiritual well-being. That is not only to be able to understand the world, but to apply that knowledge in changing it. The idea came up as we should take a field trip and sort of the ridiculousness of equating Cuba, thinking of Cuba as a field trip, but we were completely serious. Once we started to discuss it, it's to me it kind of clicked as in, of course I want to go to Cuba. It just seemed like a logical next step for this reading group to move from the sort of theoretical into really seeing how black resistance is lived. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get used to it. I'm just playing with the camera. We understood ourselves as going almost as emissaries, you know, from Yale African American Studies, um, and that we kind of represented a larger group of people who may have wanted to go, but were not, were not able to go. The video would probably be most important as um, an educational tool. How does Cuba impact our, our thinking about a variety of different things, you know? Just what's really lacking out there is just dialogue and people talking like sort of off the cuff about human. I think it's important to kind of talk a little bit about the process of actually getting ready to go. So a lot of obstacles. The U.S. government's economic embargo bans Americans from freely traveling to Cuba. There are some exceptions for researchers, students, journalists, artists, and Cuban Americans. The U.S. remains the only country in the world to have any restrictions on trade or travel to Cuba. We wanted initially to raise enough money to have all of our expenses funded uh, for the whole group. And that uh, began to seem like something that would be impossible. Each of us going to the discretionary funds of our separate departments outside of African American Studies and asking for monies. The money thing was a huge obstacle and it, it was a constant reminder of the kind of antagonistic space we were in at Yale. There are a lot of pots of money around the campus, um, but they're more for, we discovered, planning conferences or bringing speakers to campus or things like that, um, and not sending a group of students off to a forbidden country <laughs> um, to explore socialism and uh, radical black politics. Uh, so even while I was participating, I was kind of like, "This ain't gonna work. This ain't gonna work." It's like we don't have the money, you know. I mean, and, and it's true. It's like they did not. People were not forthcoming with money for this trip, and there's some surprising people that you would think would be supporting. But Robin was very clear that we were going to do it, and it was going to happen. We were able to throw some fundraisers. You know, we had a film festival. And we also just asked, like, every little organization, fiefdom, whatever, at Yale that we could for some money. And we were able to cobble together enough funding. There was never a sense of, these are the people that have funding and can go to Cuba, and these are the people that can't. It was very much a sort of community ethos of, well, what's the point of me being able to go if you know, this other person can't go. And how, you know, how much of a conflict is that if we proclaim to be um, interested in, you know, a socialist society and, and visiting it and participating in that experiment? Who packed up the bag? Everything's in there. We got all the Radio yeah, Shack stuff? in there. So the, um, the topic was 1968 to 2002, are we still radicals, right? Well, every single one of these panelists was basically saying, yes, I'm still a radical. This one woman said that just her being one of the 1.5% of black tenured faculty at Oberlin, she is a radical. Oh, please. And I was like, okay, let me see where she's going with this. And she goes, just me being that 1.5%, being part of that 1.5% of the faculty who goes into a board meeting or goes into a department meeting, I am being a radical. And I was like, okay, so that means that Clarence Thomas is being a radical by going to the Supreme Court oh, and Colin Clower being a radical, being a radical and called Condoleezza Rice. Rice. I was like, that's some bullshit. Mm. And everybody in the audience was head nodding. Like, I was like, okay, that's... these are all conservative black folks right here. Uh, so, Teresa, you were going to tell us something about your parents? Uh, my father, he's kind of like a quasi-intellectual. He taught math for many years. He's extremely well-read. 
he watches like five different newscasts. <laughs> One summer vacation, we went to Myrtle Beach, North Carolina. And while everybody else was out on the beach, having a good time, like throwing the frisbee, my father made us sit and watch the Iran-Contra hearings. But it was designed to be kept a secret from the American people. I think that growing up in that environment makes me question things. And I think that's a really important link in terms of how people become politicized or think about politics. You were telling us about how um, having Nathan radicalized oh, yeah. you in a number of ways. Being a parent has really radicalized me. You know, being a parent has really radicalized me. To me, at the heart of revolutionary struggle is a concern for the conditions in which we socially raise our, ch our children and our future generations. I don't think that revolutionary struggle is just something that one does for themselves. And we're on our way to Cuba. Are you excited? Do you believe it? Of course I'm excited. <laughs> Cuba means a lot to me. It's very mythological. I want to show solidarity with the Cuban people. I'm very proud of the Cuban people. I feel like Cuba's piece in the puzzle, a missing link. I'm already inspired, I haven't left the airport. No corporate restaurant chains, no strip malls, no McDonald's, or any of that. Completely changes the just the physical landscape is stunning. I remember being very struck. All the billboards that you would see, and you, there weren't that many, but they were talking about history and the nation's history, and you could say they were propagandistic, but they seemed to me to be much more valuable than like you know advertisements for Bacardi rum or <laughs> Absolute Vodka or something like that. I'm sorry because of the rain, and so we're going to have rain during the whole day. But we were praying to have uh, rain because we are in the middle of our dry season. We were praying too much, probably, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we're going to be going through the program so that you can know what is going on. I know that this is important for the Afro-American and people and also for Cuba because you know the link between Macron X and Fidel Castro and our revolution. We always maintain the hopes that this relation could be possible. This is a, a, the opportunity for you to get it clarified about our revolution. region. The definition of Caribe is not only a geographical definition, it's an ideological definition, an historical definition. This is more important. The similarities are made by the colonialism. Colonialism is a practice of domination, which involves the subjugation of one people by another. This domination increases economic gain and political power. Most of the indigenous people of Cuba were Arawak or Guanajata Bay. They fought against Christopher Columbus, Diego Velazquez, and other representatives of Spain's elite. The Spanish colonizers used advanced military weaponry and professional troops 
This regime also developed an arbitrarily violent criminal justice system, which disproportionately punished indigenous people. The vast majority of the indigenous people of Cuba died or were marginalized within 100 years of Columbus' arrival. Spain's takeover of Cuba, along with the subjugation of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, gave Spain a political and economic monopoly in the Caribbean. The lack of environmental regulations and trade restrictions allowed for the Cuban elite to form two lucrative interdependent enterprises, industrial agriculture and slave labor. Slavery is a system where people are treated as property and forced to work. It exists for the purposes of lowering labor costs and increasing profits. Between 1511 and 1865, nearly one million Africans were kidnapped, sold as if they were property, and forced to work in Cuba as slaves. Cuba became the largest slave importing colony in the Caribbean. Cuban plantation owners constructed homes and slave quarters so that laborers were under surveillance at all times. They were forced to live in barracones, which are walled-in villages where men and women are separated with a courtyard. Those who tried to escape were dismembered or hunted down by slave hunters called ranchiadores. In spite of the risk, Cuban slaves frequently disrupted the authority of plantation owners. They organized armed revolts and lived in maroon communities of escaped slaves that raided plantations, destroyed property, and liberated other slaves. This is the, the monument for the maroons that escaped from their left, the slave masters that used to live in this area. All this area was covered by woods. And this is like a symbol, praying for their God to help them. And so in that way, they have like this big casserole. It was like a smoke coming out of the, the, the casserole. And then that smoke, it was like a sort of guidance for where to go and where not to go in order to continue the, to, to free them. Joshua. Habla. Uh, this is intense because there are so few monuments in the world to the struggle, to the horror of slavery, but also the struggle against slavery. And this, to, to have this monument here that's, that's a symbol of this resistance alongside or as you know, a part of this town and this community that was built out of the struggle of the revolution, the Cuban revolution, to see these two things together really united both in, in kind of um, uh, historical memory, but also living reality, and to see those two things together is intense, and just it's very also sort of spiritual because we're here in the mountains, you know, in this valley, and uh, you know you can sort of feel the the, the unity of nature, and uh, it's, it's intense, and, uh, and it feels good. Cuban slaves are also engage in cultural resistance using song, dance, folktale, religion that validated their humanity and community. aspect in the Caribbean history. The plantation not only organized the economy of all of this country, but organized the society too. The society where the white was in the top of the society, and the black African is a slave or freedom in the bottom of the society.
30 years. The Cuban were fighting 30 years in order to obtain their independence. Imperialism is a system of domination in which a country exercises power over another through settlement, political rule, military force, or indirect mechanisms of control. The patriot that began the war, Carlos Manuel de Césped, he freed their slave. In order they fight in, in equal situation as a citizen in order to obtain the independence. And the majority of the soldiers at the end of the war were black or mulatos. For example, Antonio Maceo is the paradigm because he's the, 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 the biggest. The U.S. declared war on Spain in 1898 in order to gain imperial rule over Cuba. In most American classrooms, we learn to call this conflict the Spanish-American War. In Cuba, they call it the U.S. intervention on Cuba's war of independence. As a result of the war, the U.S. was able to gain dominance over Cuba, as well as Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. I'm talking about 1902, when he was elected as the president of Cuba, he just decided to represent the American interests in our country and not the Cubans any, anymore. That's why we consider him as a traitor. And because of him, we still have the military base, Guantanamo military base. He was the one who signed the amendment, which is called the Black Amendment, which allowed the American government to uh, have military bases in our Corruption is the abuse of power by public officials for private gain. In the early 20th century, the U.S. installed and supported Cuban government leaders. The U.S. used its influence to increase the profits of private American companies which dominated the island's economy. U.S. companies owned about 40% of the Cuban sugar lands, almost all the cattle ranches, 90% of the mines and mineral concession, 80% of the utilities, and practically all the oil industry. With U.S. military support and economic aid, these leaders suppressed social movements and rebellions that would oppose their corruption. While African Americans were rising up, Cubans began their own revolution. A coalition of students, workers, farmers, and armed forces called the July 26th Movement used nonviolent civil disobedience and guerrilla warfare to combat the corrupt Batista regime. The armed wing of the movement included Juan Almeida, Raul and Fidel Castro, Celia Sanchez, Che Guevara. And these are some of the uh, tortures that were applied to this group of men, as well as some tools that were used for torturing. And many persons that had nothing to do with this action were tortured here as well.
after years of organizing and bloodshed, Batista and his supporters surrendered. The leaders of this movement took power over the Cuban government on January 1st, 1959. Once they came into power, they started to make changes U.S. elites didn't like. The new government ended private education, nationalized private property, and made racial discrimination illegal. You stand in front of Moncada, but what's it like? What are you thinking? I really feel like this is our revolution, you know? I feel like this is more than just a revolution in Cuba. I really feel like it's the revolution of a lot of principles. Just the fact that now it's a school, you know? And seeing the children come up and down, the way they've kept those principles alive. I want to go back to the States and, and help bring some life to this idea of revolution and try to imbue it with some form that like revolution is possible that's something that i'm getting from this space i mean that, that revolution is something that can be made and that it's something that can be sustained on a daily basis that's something that i really uh uh feeling is lacking from our communities and i'm just really uh, uh feeling honored to be on this spot right here and i feel like there's a real reason why this blockade is uh, trying to not just obstruct uh, political relations and economic relationships between the United States and Cuba, but it's also trying to stop our people and our communities from coming and seeing this spirit of resistance, that people actually uh, believed in something so solid and so hard that they would put their lives on the line and they would dedicate themselves to uh, social justice and change. The spirit in which the embargo was created uh, was really an attempt to completely isolate Cuba as much as possible. During the 1950s and 60s, when, when communism was growing, uh, when the Soviet Union was becoming a world superpower, and Fidel Castro was gaining power, Cuba started nationalizing a lot of U.S. companies in Cuba. This upset the Americans, and so what this resulted in was a complete economic, commercial, and financial embargo against Cuba. We'll consider lifting the embargo only if the Cuban leader embraces democracy, mm. and the president offered this list of demands. Free political prisoners, allow opposition parties to organize and speak freely, hold competitive national assembly elections next year, international monitors, allow a national referendum to gauge Cuban support for free speech and other civil liberties. Then. And only then, I will explore ways with the United States Congress to ease economic sanctions. Good afternoon. Today, the United States of America is changing its relationship with the people of Cuba. These 50 years have shown that isolation has not worked. It's time for a new approach. We are taking steps to increase travel, commerce, and the flow of information to and from Cuba. This is fundamentally about freedom and openness, and also expresses my belief in the power of people-to-people -people engagement. No hay respeto a los derechos humanos por parte del gobierno cubano. Porque ahora mismo, si nosotros queremos salir a caminar, por las calles, las avenidas de nuestra ciudad de La Habana no lo podemos hacer porque el gobierno cubano tiene estas turbas y no nos va a permitir salir. Entonces los derechos humanos aquí no hay, el gobierno los viola, están secuestrados. Over 80 people were arrested over the weekend at peaceful anti-Wall Street protests. They maced five women. The captain stepped up, maced their faces, and then tried to run away and avoid cameras that were around. It's not a practice of Amnesty International to compare one country to another and say, you know, country X's human rights record is, is much worse than, than country Y. Um, just because a, a violation is a violation and abuse is an abuse. The embargo has been in place for over 50 years. And 
there's been no evidence that shows that the embargo has improved the human rights of either Americans or Cubans or anyone residing in both countries. In fact, Amnesty International research has shown quite the opposite. It's been quite detrimental to human rights, to the human rights of individuals in the United States and in Cuba. Viva Cuba Libre! Mm. So how does it feel to be standing here from the Che? It's good. Hasta la victoria siempre. But to be at the Ministry of the Interior where Che works, which is where he's vision, I put you right here. Porque esa ola la forman los más, los mayoritarios en todos los aspectos. Los que acumulan con su trabajo las riquezas, crean los valores, hacen andar las ruedas de la historia y que ahora despiertan del largo sueño embrutecedor a que los sometieron. Porque esta gran humanidad ha dicho basta y ha echado a andar. The Cuban government provided support and solidarity to independence movements in Algeria, Angola, the Congo, and South Africa. Medical and military aid from Cuba helped Algerian rebels and their children. Che Guevara and a small group of Afro-Cuban rebels helped the Congolese national movements attempt to continue their struggle for self-determination. The struggle had been thwarted after the CIA endorsed the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. Cuba sent military instructors, special forces, as well as millions of dollars worth of advanced weaponry, which enabled Angola to defend itself against foreign occupations. Cuba also played a major role in the fight against apartheid in South Africa. Africa for us is part of our, our, our being. Africans were brought here and what we are is because they were brought here. In the United States, we usually see Cubans who look like this. In fact, 60% of Cubans are Afro-Cubans who look like this. terms of issues of race is that people not of obviously African descent could talk about being of African descent because they're in a mixed race country. Even if you seem like a white person or you're read as a white person, you have been impacted by the history of slavery and all of the other migrations throughout the Caribbean and throughout the world into Cuba. So I think there's a kind of openness to talk about race, to talk about Africa, that there isn't in the United States. I think there's a kind of complacency that people have in this country of, well, you're white, you just wouldn't understand, or you're not of this experience, so you just wouldn't understand. One thing is very important is the feeling that Cubans have that we are closer to African Americans than to Americans in general, that we have more understanding Cuba supported and provided political asylum to several committed African-American activists, including Robert F. Williams and Asada Shakur. A political prisoner is someone who is prosecuted because of their political activism or because they committed politically motivated crimes. Robert F. Williams encouraged Southern African Americans to legally defend themselves against white supremacist terrorism. The Negroes must be prepared to repulse attacks, that they must be willing to fight, that they must be willing to die and to kill if necessary, that uh, there was no law and no 14th Amendment 
uh, to the United States Constitution of equal protection in the South, and that therefore they didn't have any deterrent, so they would have to create the, the, the deterrent force themselves. Receiving political asylum from Cuba between 1962 and 1965 allowed Williams to communicate to his grassroots base through a program called Radio Free Dixie. He founded the Crusader, a progressive newspaper, and became president of the Revolutionary Action Movement. Asada Shakur, who describes her slave name as Joanne Chesimard, was a student activist at Borough Manhattan Community College. She became a leader of the Harlem chapter of the Black Panther Party. Later, she was associated with the Black Liberation Army. Freedom, justice, equality, decent living for people is, if there's a complete change, a complete change, everything has, has got to be turned around and that, that's a revolution, a complete change. Asada, along with fellow activists Zaid Malik Shakur and Sundiata Akoli, were pulled over while driving on the New Jersey Turnpike on May 2nd, 1973. One of the New Jersey state troopers on the scene later admitted that the police pulled over these activists because they were black while driving a car with Vermont license plates. There was a confrontation in which Asada Shakur was shot in her arms, shoulder, and back. State Trooper Warner Forrester and Zaid Malik Shakur were killed. Although the medical experts at trial supported Asada's version of events, she was convicted by an all-white jury and sentenced to life plus 33 years. The Hands Off Asada campaign asserts that she was framed for the murder of Zaid Shakur and Warner Forrester because of her political activism. After spending two years in a maximum security federal prison, while in solitary confinement, fearing she would be murdered, Shakur escaped. She lived underground for five years until Cuba granted her political asylum in 1984. What it was prison, prison was hell. It was a new kind of plantation. I feel like a, I feel like a maroon woman. I feel like an escaped slave because what I, I saw in, in, in the United States in those prisons was slavery. It was black people with chains in cells. It was just poor people, you know, I mean, just stepped on and smashed. I'll never forget what I saw. I'll never forget what I've lived through. I'll never forget what my people have lived through. The FBI currently offers a reward for assistance with her capture. The activists who were convicted in the U.S. of helping Asada with her escape, Marilyn Buck, Mutulu Shakur, Sekou Odinga, and Sylvia Baraldini, incarcerated or have died in prison. Bueno, primeramente hay que investigar y hay que conocernos. Porque yo he estado en Estados Unidos y muchas personas no sabían que aquí había gente negra. Entonces primero tenemos que conocer la historia común, investigar, conocernos entre todos, ¿me entiendes? Conocer que hay negros en México, conocer que hay negros en, en Colombia, conocer que hay negros en Cuba, conocer las cosas comunes, cómo funcionó el sistema de plantación, cómo funcionó el colonialismo cómo funcionó la, la, la economía para esos negros después que fueron terminó la esclavitud, cómo ellos vivieron. Tenemos que conocernos, ¿me entiendes? Conocer la historia de los Estados Unidos, de los afroamericanos, por qué eh, el negro cubano se siente cubano, ante todo cubano y no afrocubano, por qué en Estados Unidos no se sienten de la misma forma. One of the first things done by the revolution was to give same opportunities for everyone. Legally, it was stated that the color of the skin or the gender or whatever uh, difference is not to be used for giving privilege to different people. And uh, for a long time we thought, that's it. Every problem is solved. 
But then, with time, we started to notice that it's not enough to say that we are the same in front of the law. Race issues are very touchy issues here for Cubans. Unity is very important. For Cubans, unity is our weapon to defend our country. So if I start to bring out differences, I might be regarded as attempting against unity. They think that you're going to steal something just because you're black, and they say, I quarry a lot about that things as well. It pees, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using this word, but it pees you really out. I mean, it's just really tense the, the situation a little bit. But little by little, I guess, also we black, we need to change people's mind. Like, the other day I was walking with uh, my Swiss friends on the street, I was asked for my ID, and then they say, uh, why are you asking? I ask, why are you asking me for my ID? I can walk freely with a phone here in Cuba. I'm Cuban. And I said, no, 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 but you know why we're asking. I don't know why you're asking for my ID, so I need to know. And I said, you know, come on, you're Cuban. And I said, hey, well, I gave you my ID, and what do you do? I'm a tour guide and I'm also an English teacher from, um, from the Ministry of Foreign Trade. And you tell me the truth, it's just because I'm black, you know, that's the problem. And the police also, we need to educate the police as well. We need to educate certain fields within the society. I mean, that's, I'm talking about my own experience. Probably you have some other people that will tell you like different things, but I'm telling you about my own experience that I think it's, most of the black people feel in the same way, in that way. Some people, let's say, make a joke in which a black person looks stupid. And I go and say, listen, this is racism, what you're doing. And this person says, no, I have many friends who are black and there's no problem with that. It's just a joke. And this person doesn't understand that it's teaching this just a joke to children and it's conveying a way of understanding life. Culturally, we have been using certain kind of language. There are things that just go invisible. We have been given the, the same opportunity as any other citizen here in Cuba. Some people have taken it, some other don't, but uh, some, some other haven't, I mean. But I think that it's not a matter of having opportunities or having an important post within the society. Sometimes you find people like, they say, hey, you speak English, you speak French, you, you are not, you're not black, you are, uh, you're white. And I say, no, 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 I'm black. That's the problem, they, they don't want to recognize us as black. They think that we are not intelligent and stuff like that, so you feel like a little bit frustrated. That's, that's a little a small comment I wanted to make. I don't know. <laughs> okay, ready to eat. Hola, hola, hola. Hola, hola, hola. I mean, every society is a society of contradictions. You know, in the United States, we have the same, we have the same kind of thing. You can go to an expensive restaurant that's you know, down the block, around the corner from more humble places. You know, Cuba, for all of its struggles and everything, is the same. It has the same contradictions, or similar parallel contradictions. This is, you know, another manifestation. This is, you know, so sit down and enjoy the meal. Sit down and eat and you know, reflect. <laughs> Um, reflections on my whiteness, um, you know, the, 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 a lot of the tourism in, in, in Havana are European tourists and white tourists and, and, you know, 
being here, um, I think it's really important and something I, I do, I am conscious of right now, is that, um, and rightfully so, people, you know, probably their initial reaction to me is, is going to be one of skepticism or maybe even, even, even deeper than that, knowing what um, or how maybe the vast majority of European tourists handle themselves here, their power relationship with people in, in Cuba, but, but people of color really all over the world. We're at this wonderful beach resort catering to the European tourist market. Playing this wonderful, how shall we say, uh, European dance music. I offered Tucker $20 if he could get them to play a uh, Black Star CD. Tyler Kwali and most definitely. Tried it out, he returned unsuccessful, so looks like that wasn't really the, the niche they were going for. They don't have a CD player, so we're going to try some tape. After the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, Cuba made some capitalist reforms that increased its dependence on tourism. See if like the tourism is bringing resources, if money is coming back into Cuban civil society, that towns and are improving, and hospitals and schools and people's homes too. Home life I think is improving through this. You know, people are paying whatever 200, 250 dollars a night to stay, whatever it is to stay here. But if that's not being seen, this is like a, this is a potential like taking time of a route to go, and I'm not. I mean, I'm trying not to critique it too hard. I mean, I don't, I talk. I believe in socialism, but as dead press as living and breathing it, not just fucking believing it, we don't on this trip, but none of us as much as, and I think there's a lot of people who are contemplating that, what it means to do that. It's a pity that uh, in the tourist industry, when you're working with clients, you are not able to take it to your homes. It's, not possible. But well, if you come some other time and you can play some for what you see, they live in a, what we call Solaris. It's like different apartments, one next to the other one. I was raised up in there. It's, it's a poor uh, part of uh, my mother. She's a nurse and now she's retired. Little by little, they started coming to the capital looking for a better life. In terms of uh, supporting the family, helping, helping the family, is a, a good time to do it now. It's what I want to do, like, sometimes people say that, hey, I'll have a good too first. And I say, I have, I have to take advantage now that I'm young. <laughs> this is my life in a way. And there's a lot of uh, responsibilities that I have. What you're saying is really the same reality that a lot of Americans are My dream when I was a little kid was to get into university because I remember that I saw lawyers with their, with their cars, you know, very elegant, very respected. You know, he's a lawyer, you know, he's a doctor, he's a teacher, but now, you know, opposite. You got like people working in the tourist industry, like they make more than any other lawyer, being a doctor, being a teacher, whatever. You need to change it. You need to prioritize those things. I wasn't forced, but I just said, hey, I have to do it. No matter what, but I love my profession as an English teacher, as a translator, but I need to do this because it's the only way I have. Aquí 
mí para ustedes de corazón adentro, de sentimiento. Sabe que yo lo que mato, que lo que digo, poca persona, que perdón, amigo, a mí que te digo que vengo de esto, de esto, de esto. Gracias. El futuro mío tiene un cuerpo con mi música. Quisiera mucho salir de aquí, créanme, ya estoy. Claro, no estoy cansado, pero ya lo conozco todo, casi todo. Entonces siempre he dado la, la, la manera de no fundirme. There were this group of MCs, it was two MCs. These two guys talked about if they were if they were in the United States, they could just wake up in the morning, go downstairs to their studio, lay down some tracks, and be able to like put out a video the next day. And we were like, I don't that we live in the United States. You can't do that. <laughs> And one of the things that really struck me was their idea of the United States. It really reminded me of kids that I, you know, my cousins or my little brother, kids from the neighborhood that I grew up in in the Bronx. This idea that there is a kind of, a, it's an alternative American dream. In a sense, it's not the like, if you work hard, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's the, it's the sense that comes from the media about what life is like in the United States and that the idea that life can be like that for you. Even though food and people can't necessarily travel easily between the US and Cuba, these images in the media of popular culture do travel really easily. universal public education, and a comprehensive jobs program. In Cuba, more blacks own their own houses than anywhere in the world. Their unemployment rate is consistently 2%. What does it for money? For money? Yes. In school. In school, there is a competition for computers, and they give money for a month. Money for a month. If I go to school, Fidel Castro, para mí, dinero. Yo, sí. escuela. In the United States, the racial segregation of educational opportunities persists. Fight, fight for school! Fight, fight, fight for school! Fight, fight. Although race doesn't determine a person's intellectual capabilities, African American adults have higher rates of illiteracy than whites. African American children are tracked three times more than white children for special education programs. The quality of public education in Cuba improved radically after the revolutionary government ended private education and launched a nationwide campaign for adult literacy. Over 50 years later, Cuba still has nearly a 100% literacy rate, and they have a quality of basic educational opportunities across racial lines and class divides.
obvious poverty, but in terms of misery, I didn't see the kind of misery that I see right out here in New York City. The state doesn't want to spend money on our kind of patients because they're black and brown. Because they're black or because they're poor? Both. Both. If you look at whites, poor whites, and poor blacks, poor whites have worse health care than richer whites. But even if you look at them compared to people at the, on the same income level, non-whites have worse health care. They have uh, less access to, uh, to the system. We African Americans have higher death rates for stroke, cancer, diabetes, asthma, and HIV AIDS than whites. Alcohol is probably the, the leading cause of disease in patients who are admitted to this hospital. And why? The question why a community and why a community is more prone to be on any alcohol is purely social. And it's related to their inability to survive in the setting, the economic and political setting of this city at this time. And it's, it's more than this city, it's, it's related to this country also. That seems to suggest that something like half the adult community around here is seeking oblivion one way or another. Yeah, I would have no trouble alcohol. saying that 50% of the patients have some type of drug-related problem if you include alcohol. In Cuba, there's free public health care for everyone. Afro-Cubans are the healthiest black population in the Americas. is their desire to live. In the U.S., I'm 10 times more likely than a white man to be a victim of homicide. One time. 10 times. I'm nearly 30 times more likely than a white woman to be a victim of homicide. One time. 30 times. In Cuba, there are more restrictive gun laws and less killing. The homicide right there is less than a third of what it is for African Americans. Neighborhood Association put on a performance for us and they had their children singing and dancing. We were invited to the block party and it was just really awesome. You know, how these kids doing this great song and dance, you know, performance piece in not a community of means, you know, the performance is with like one light bulb that they like string from inside somebody's house, but it's like they make it into a stage and it's amazing, you know. 
in order to show us the best of who they were. They showed us their children and what they teach their children about being Cuban and being a part of that community. And it occurred to me that giving people the resources they need to take care of each other, to take care of their children, is how we will overcome. think that Yale is sincere, those black students at Yale are sincere. Um, think they're just there for front? They're just there for front. And, and, and until they realize why they got there, how they got there. Do you think they're being trained to be leaders? They're being trained to be leaders, but I don't think they're being trained to be leaders to come back in the black community. Well, even where they go, can they help black people where they go as they're trained now? They could, they could, true, they could, but will they? This is a group that said, we're going to try something that's going to be hard to do. Traveling the U.S. to Cuba is not easy. Um, and we're going to do, we're going to just, you know, this is our intellectual project. And boom, you guys went. And you actually made the transition from being book smart to trying to figure this out on the ground. So it actually reinforced to me, as I thought about it, the idea that when people say, oh, well, this won't happen, or they're going to say no, or just, you know, they don't even try, basically. That's the one way to guarantee you'll never get anything. There are many of our people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly and are beginning to see the importance of lifting it uh, out of the national context. And the only way this can be done is by internationalizing the problem. Instead of it being called civil rights in the future, we're going to have to label it a human rights struggle or the struggle for human rights. It becomes a world problem. Any form of discrimination, including racial discrimination, is a violation of human rights. It's on all of us to really call on our policymakers. A world in which everyone can freely enjoy human rights is certainly possible. African Americans are in the middle of a struggle in their country. And we Cubans, we are in the middle of a struggle too. That brings us together. There's nowhere that you can go in the United States and, and see a predominantly black community that doesn't have serious issues with poverty, serious issues with drugs, serious issues with violence. It's hard to convince yourself that there can be another way but there's another way. Pa que vea como sube mi, mi marea. 
somos fregonas, ahora somos raperas. Llegó la hora, emancipación, libre elección. Vamos a vencer. Pero las crudas en molde han quebrado Sexo femenino, vamos a vencer Vamos a vencer